Thank you. Good morning. It is good to be with you. Always a joy to be with the forever family. Amen. Always good. One day, one day we won't have to go home. As was mentioned by somebody, I can't remember his name for some reason. Um, I did have a birthday yesterday, and I thank all of you who sent cards and sent cakes and pies and cookies. And if you didn't do that, I, I'm not saying that to make you feel guilty and to, to guilt you into sending me or making me cakes or pies or cookies. It's your choice what you want to do with your life. If you're satisfied with the back row seat in heaven, that's fine with me. I'm just sharing. No, thank you so much for all that you did. Um, I turned what the great theologian S. Hagar could not drive. I, I turned 55 yesterday. Uh, Sheila took a guess yesterday of 46, for which she is now my favorite and has that nice front row seat. But it's funny as you get older, as is often said, not funny ha-ha, but funny. I think of a, a statement I heard uh, at Polishing the Pulpit a few years ago. There was an, an older preacher who stepped up, and, and the first thing he said was how good polishing the pulpit was because you get to assemble with all your, the people you maybe graduated with or you went to preaching school together with or, or you had just known at another congregation. And he said, the funny thing is, he says, me and my other fellow preachers, when we got together in our 20s and 30s, we're always talking about, you know, the books we had read, the, the books we had bought, the lectureships we had spoken on, and all of our accomplishments. And he says, and now when we get together in our 50s and 60s, all we do is talk about the medications we're on and the surgeries we're going to have. And what makes that funny is, it's true. So after the service, if you'd like to talk to me about my medications or upcoming surgeries, I'd be happy to field those questions. I've been blessed. Uh, I've had good health. And being a good Irishman, that's the only thing I can attribute it to. I may be 55, but I always feel this many. So very happy. But thinking about aging is what generated this sermon. This was not going to be the sermon for this morning, but thinking about aging and it got me thinking. The title has a double meaning. There are two meanings that can be found in it. For indeed the church is a church for all ages. It, the church that was founded by our Lord in the first century is the church of today and will be the church on the day our Lord returns. Certainly there are expedients that changed with the times. Uh, they didn't use PowerPoint in the first century, but uh, those of you who may be old enough or have just seen uh, video of older sermons, do you remember the sheets that preachers would have up? And they'd have all the notes and all the things, so the, the sheet sermons. What were those but PowerPoint, right? The technology may change. The expedience may change. But who the church is? And what determines who the church is and what the church is to be about, it is unchanging from the first century to today to the end. Unchanging. And, and, and I know I say this a lot, but it, if you haven't had the opportunity to travel, one of the most reassuring, encouraging, strengthening things I have had in my ministry I've been able to travel, and you go all over this country, and I don't even mean this country. Uh, I got to go worship in Australia and New Zealand. And you know what I found there? I found this church there. It's the same, because it's the same book, it's the same truths. How encouraging is that? How easy and simple is that? Because it's unchanging. A church for all ages. But the second meaning is what I really want to talk about this morning that the church is a church for all ages of people, okay? The text that's there, the context of Ephesians 4, 15 and 16, is that Jesus has supplied the church with the information 
that it needs, that we need. Supplied us with teachers and shepherds so that we may grow unto Christ-likeness, which is the goal and the pursuit of all the church. And that, as you see there, that every part of this body of Christ may do its share of the work. Every part does its share. And when you combine that with Paul's teaching in his writing to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 12, he used that illustration of the members of the church are like the members of the body. We are different. There are different functions. There are different abilities. But we are all part of the same body. We are all important, vitally important. And we all have work to be about. And that's what I want to talk about as briefly as I'm able this morning. I want to talk about the fact that there is work to be done for all the ages who find themselves in the church. We're going to just divide it up into three different ages. I'm going to talk about the young, the youth. And, and where do I draw that line? Well, you know, if you want to think 18, if you want to think 20 and less, that's fine. Obviously, people are different, you know. We tease Susie, who's, who left, convenient time to leave. Um, Susie's been 35 for the last six or seven years, and she's only 16. 17 next week, but um, Aaron often seems 25 to 30. He seems like that, right? You know, so there is a difference. But when I'm talking youth, I'm talking 18, 20. I'm talking about not adults, okay? And then we're going to talk about the middle. In the middle, I'm going to kind of use more of a Levitical term there, right? We're going to talk about roughly 25 to 50, right? And again, obviously, there are, there are things that go across those lines. And then the last group is going to be the older, as we like to say, the seasoned among us, okay? What we want to discover is that each one of these groups of ages, like each one of the members of the body, is vitally important and has work that they are to be about and needs to be done if the church as a whole would grow, edify itself in love. And, and that's grow internally, meaning growing more and more Christ-like, but also for a chance to grow numerically and in number, which I guess is the same thing I just repeated myself. So, okay. So let us begin by talking about the young. There are two unintentional mistakes that it would be wise for the Lord's church not to make. The first is this. Sometimes it is said, the children, and unfortunately, ironically, a lot of our youth are not here this morning. We are blessed here to have quite a few youth. The youth are the church of tomorrow. Have you ever heard that? I understand what's meant. The idea is the young people that we see in the pews today are, are going to be the preachers, elders, elders, wives, the, the ladies group of the future. That's what's meant. Here's what can happen. The way we speak influences the way we think just as the way we think influences the way we speak. It's like when we talk about we, we don't have to get up tomorrow and go to the church, right? Because if you say that enough, do not be deceived, as the good book says, you can begin to think that this is the church. We understand that, and you, you often hear that pause, right? Well, remember, tomorrow we have to go to the church building. Right? Well, that's good. Correct yourself, because this is a building. We are the church. When we say that children are the church of the future, or the church of tomorrow, what can be heard in that is, they are not the church today. 
And that can combine with our thinking so that children's role in church is to shut it. Sit down, be quiet. And then we wonder why children don't look forward to church. We're going to church tomorrow. Now sit down, be quiet, don't make any noise. How fun is that? Now, are there times when children, not just children, when I'm up here speaking, I appreciate most of you being uh, at least a little bit quiet, except for when I ask for amen or you want to just give one, then that's fine. Um, but it can sound like children are just supposed to endure church. And that's why there are many groups and even, I will say, this is my opinion, sadly, many even among the church have started removing children from aspects of worship. They have what's called children's church where they take them away and do other things because they don't want them interfering. But again, then we wonder why the children don't feel a part of the church. Here's the second mistake we would be wise to avoid. Some churches are very cognizant of the valuable resource that children are. And we want to keep them busy and active because we know we're in competition with the world. And so we create a youth group. And sadly, what is often done is we hire a young minister instead of a youth minister. Do you hear the difference there? Because what is the job and purpose of those who are leading the youth but to edify them and to help them get wisdom. And as I have heard it said, please don't read too much into the cynicism maybe that's in it, but what wisdom does a 21, a 22, or a 23-year-old have? Now, if you would have asked Rick that when he was 21, 22, 23, I would have told you all the wisdom I had. Do you understand the point? So we have this group. We take our youth and we, I've seen in churches where they sit in their own little section. They're all, all the youth are over here. The church is over here and the youth are over here. And the youth are always getting together with their young minister. And they're playing games and they're eating pizza and they're watching movies. Is there anything wrong with that? Of course there's nothing wrong with that. But here's what happens. I heard it called this at Polish in the Pulpit. You end up with the one-eared Mickey Mouse. Picture that silhouette. Where you've got the church, and then there's the youth group. Dare I say, separate and apart. And then what happens? Well, they grow up. And they never connect to the church because they say, we just never really felt a part of the church. Because they weren't. They were separate and apart. We don't want to do that with our youth and alienate them. What is God's pattern? It's the family. That's the unit. And what did he call his church? It's the family. And we're here together. We need to understand that. So that our youth understand that not only are they a part, a vital part of the church, but there's work that they need to be about. What is that work? Well, one of the most important works for the youth is they are to be trained. Because despite what children think, they are not born knowing very much. So we must instruct them, right? Deuteronomy 6, the Bible's filled with those admonitions to take what Take this word of God, parents, and, and put it inside you and then teach your children always everywhere. The oft-quoted Proverbs 22 and verse 6. If we train them up, you understand that when they get older, they'll continue more than likely in what they've been trained in. Ephesians 6 and 4. Fathers, be careful how you do that. You don't want to provoke them to wrath, but train them up. In 6.13, we're going to talk about that. Oh, I never mind. Uh, I changed my PowerPoint. Um, turn, if you would, to Ephesians 6, verse 13. It was originally uh, there at the bottom. Children, can you hear me? You were at the age 
to be trained. Your parents, your greater family, grandparents, the church has oriented itself to train you and to teach you the things you need to know to go to heaven and to have that wonderful abundant life here. But look at Ephesians 6.13. I'm at Deuteronomy 6.13 which says radically different things. Ephesians 6.13 talks about taking up the whole armor of God. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Paul wrote that to Christians in Ephesus. Young people, understand it was written to you. You also need to take on that whole armor of God. We are dedicated to training you you must be dedicated to being trained. You must seek it. In order to grow up to be a warrior of God, you must go through the training. And it can seem at times like work and trouble. And the, re well, the reason the first one is true, the second one isn't true, is it is work. Anything. Aaron plays baseball. A lot of practice involved in that, isn't it? A lot of practice. Why? So that you can get good at it. Well, guess what's going to have to happen with regards to Christianity? You're going to have to go through a lot of practice. Learning this book more and more. And, and we have engaged in a unified curriculum here at the church. And, and it's a difficult thing. A lot of meetings and a lot of talk and consideration went into it. And I never turned my clock on, so I've got another at least 30 minutes, people. Sorry. I'll watch that one. This unified curriculum is organized in this way. It is designed so that we go through the whole Bible in four years. Age appropriate. So the youngest among us go through us. Brian, kind of funny. Um, go through the whole Bible at a very introductory level. Just learning names and facts and know what Noah did and know what Moses did. And then after that first four years, then there's the next four years. We're going to go through the Bible again, but now they're going to go through it in a much deeper way. We're going to start making connections with other parts of the Bible and, and helping them to understand the depth of the message there. And then after that four years, there's another four years that we go through. And that's going to be making application in their lives and, and a lot of discussion back and forth. You see, it's taking this, putting it in, and reinforcing it over and over so that you may be trained. So our young people will know their Bible, the simple facts, but also the deep truths. Here's the two things that are necessary, though, for that to work. Three things. There must be teachers willing to put in the work to teach. Two. There must be parents who understand that these things, these lessons build upon one another. So when you're missing half or two-thirds or a third or of those lessons, the purpose is going to have big holes in it. And the last thing it requires is students who want to be taught, who understand the importance. And obviously that's reinforced by parents. That's reinforced by the church as a whole. Teaching Bible should be like feeding a hungry person. Easy to do. Because someone who doesn't want to learn the Bible, what's that like? It's like trying to feed the baby broccoli. It's going to end up all over the floor and thrown at you, and not much nourishment is going to happen. Okay? Youth, you've got to seek to be trained. You are growing. Now, it can be fun. We're going to have fun. We're going to have events. We're going to, you guys just had the Olympics at my house. And, and we get together and do things that are enjoyable. We come together on the Saturdays, every other Saturday, or no, I guess, yeah, twice uh, a month. And, and we listen to a lesson, but then we go and play games. We can do both, but what matters, first and foremost, is God, your salvation. 
and being raised to understand and to know. Church, we need to understand that our young need to be trained, but they also need to be trained on how to serve and how to work. Okay? They're not just little deers to be set aside and, oh, and now we're going to have a, one of our children stand up and say a Bible verse. How fantastic. It is fantastic. But there's ever so much more to being a Christian. We need to teach these young people how to serve others. Because, I don't know, you older Christians, have you noticed that that's much of what the Bible says? Our Lord said if you want to be a leader, what did he tell us we had to be? Servants. We might want to teach them that church isn't just all fun and games. It is fun, and we play games. But it's about service. It's about self-denial to serve others. Well, how do we do that? We do it, and we take them along. Mentoring is so important. To take children along when you go to visit a shut-in to take them along when you go to deliver food to someone that's sick, or whatever you do, so that they see this is the work of the church. This is the word of the church, but there is a work so that they can see it and get their hands dirty. And dare I say, here's where all the kids start disliking me. Raking leaves and mowing lawns and cleaning windows and cleaning, that's all service that teaches them invaluable lessons of what it means to be a Christian. We need to be about it. And that last note there, don't forget Proverbs. I don't know why I turned that one on. <laughs> what do I mean by don't forget Proverbs? There are many who don't think Proverbs should be in the Bible because when you read them in general, they're not terribly religious. You know, it's a lot of financial stuff. It's a lot of you should get off your behind and get to work if you plan on uh, living. There's a lot of very earthy lessons there. Why? Have you noticed where most of us are living? Very earthy, right? So these young people that we're training up in the Lord, that they may know the Word of God, know about heaven, and be pursuing it, older folks, not just parents, but older folks, they also have other things they need to learn like how to work on a car, like how to work in their house, like how to fix basic things, how to live. Now, mom and dad, I'm sure, are about that, but they not necessarily have all the, the wisdom. So let's train up our youth so that they can not only go to heaven, but they can do well here as well. And here's where it gets difficult, young people. You might not want to learn that. I can remember a foolish young man who said he didn't need to know anything about mechanical stuff because he was going to be a doctor and I can hire someone to do that. Skip to the end of that story. He's not a doctor and his cars broke down. Woulda, coulda, shoulda. Help them. And children, you ought to be pursuing that training. And there are times when it seems like our parents and even members of the church they get a little hard and a little uh, aggressive, even punishing if we don't take the training seriously. You know why that is? It's because you're not doing your job and being trained. It takes a whole team to do this. We need to be about it. We need to understand how special these young people, they are to be trained as warriors, but they can still serve today in so many ways. The middle. The middle, like I said, I'll use the Levitical from Numbers 8, 25 to 50, we'll say. These are the folks who are toiling on, okay? Working in the secular world, raising their families. They are out in the world. They are the ones, the point of the spear, if you will, out there with evangelism because they have all that contact with the world. And it is hard work. It's why they have that strength and that youth and that vigor of youth, right? But they need help too. They're about training their children up. Brethren, we can help them, can't we? 
Because one of the hardest struggles for this group is staying focused in the Word. Because the world is demanding so much of their time and effort. But they have to keep in mind that God comes first. Matthew 23 and 23. Well, don't I have to take care of my family, Rick? Yes, you do. But you're supposed to major in majors and minor in minors. Yes, you're supposed to take care of your family, but the best way you take care of your family is by seeing them to heaven. As our Lord said in Matthew 16 and verse 26, what does it profit, parents, if your children gain the whole world but lose their immortal soul? Nothing. So you got to major in majors while you minor in minors. And it's difficult. And it is heartbreaking at times. Because you're trying to do good. You're trying to help your children. And all too often, they seem to be fighting against you. But not children anymore, because now they've heard this lesson, and now they're in it to win it, and they're going to do anything you say. They're going to be, yes, Mom, yes, Dad, anything I can do. I'm done with that. What can I do now? It's hard. We need to help this group. Children, you can help them. And older, we can help them. Those in this group, I want you to consider Galatians 2 and verse 20. It's a familiar verse. Paul said that he had been crucified with Christ. All we who have put on Christ in baptism have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer we who live, but Christ lives in us as we parent, as we work, as we uh, support and supply. We do it as Christ in us. In the life that we live in the flesh, we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. To never lose sight. Again, it's a bit of riding Roman. We've got to take care of the things in the world. But God must be first and foremost. And good on you. It's hard work. The older. Please turn in your Bibles to num uh, yeah, Numbers chapter 8, please. <coughs> Verse 23. I've mentioned it. Now we'll read it. For those who are older. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This is what pertains to the Levites, that is, the priests, and obviously all Christians are priests. From 25 years old and above, one may enter to perform service in the work of the tabernacle of meeting. And at the age of 50 years, they must cease performing this work and shall work no more. Why? Because the work, especially of sacrifice, was laborious, physically taxing labor. So, 25 to 50, why you've got the vim and vigor. Well, what about after 50? Keep reading. They may minister with their brethren in the tabernacle of meeting to attend to needs, but they themselves shall do no work. Thus you shall do to the Levites regarding their duty. There comes a time when we lose a bit of that energy, when we leave the realm of the main part of the work. Of course, we never stop working, the work of shining Christ's light in this world, the light of just talking about Jesus. But the train now become more full-time trainers. As far as I can see, there is no retirement ever mentioned in this book. I see only abounding more and more. But the work changes. Okay? God has given the older time and or means to be about training and mentoring. Older folks, I'm speaking to you now. Your wisdom and experience which you have gained over the years is invaluable and must not be lost to the church. I have shared many times, my wife and I came to the Lord late and one of the things we really struggled with was how do we raise Christian children as Christian parents because we had no experience with it. 
And what we really needed was that Titus chapter 2, older women teaching the younger women and older men teaching the younger men how to do these things. Oh, I don't want to interfere with their life. You're commanded to. It's not interfering. It's wisdom that you have that we need. Sure, all of our kids can learn to stay away from a hot stove by putting their hand on it and burning it. But can't we spare them that? Can't the middle be spared a lot of the stumbles by hearing the wisdom and experience of the older? It's so valuable. I hope you understand the treasure that you have and that you are. Don't feel bad about sharing it, seeking to share it. It is so greatly desired. I don't know what it is about my wife and I, but we've both said, even as a young person, I loved sitting at the feet of an older person. I loved going up and staying with my grandma and grandpa as they talked about what the price of this used to be and, and what they used to do and, and how far they walked, you know, all those things. I was fascinated by that life that they lived. You have that treasure. Share it. Would that Paul's words toward the end of his life, when he was older, when he saw the end coming, were all Christians' last words. In 2 Timothy 4, what's going on? He thinks the end is near. He sees his death. And what does he say? He talks to a young, a middle, and he says, preach the word. Preach it in season and out of season. Be about it. Don't worry about that. He's giving him advice. He's pouring out his life experiences to him again. This one who had followed him. And he's encouraging him, saying, you go get it. You do it. Sometimes that's all that needs to be said. Take a mother that you can see has had a rough week with her children. and Just put your hand on her back and say, you're doing great. You're going to do just fine. That can be so much. Can it? What did Paul go on to say? It's one of my favorite lines now. We're facing death. Oh no. Are we going to face it with fear and trepidation? How did Paul face it? Finally. Finally. It's come. And that crown is reserved for me. Finally. All that I've been working for is coming to me. Strengthening the middle and looking forward. And brethren... That encourages. I don't mean this to be harder than I want it to be. I want it to be a positive thing. But when I hear an older Christian looking forward, I am strengthened in my faith. If I see an older Christian terrified of what may come, I become confused. I don't understand. I thought it was joy and glory and relief. It's such a powerful instruction. You have so much to give. Finally. Younger, middle, and older. Consider 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 18. The Apostle Paul wrote, But now God has set the members, talking about the body, talking about the body, He has set all the members, each one of them, in the body just as He pleased. Here we are, church, the younger, the middle, the older. Just as God is pleased, he's told us everything we need to know under life and godliness. He's given us the commands and the charge. He's encouraged us. He has pleaded with us to be about his work. And here we are, young, middle, and older, fully equipped. What will we do? Will each do its part? that the body may grow and edify itself in love, oh, we can shine the light of Christ or not. As with our God and his love, the choice is always ours. I pray that you will strive to take hold of the role God has given you and to shine Christ's light wherever you be. If you're not a Christian this morning, God loves you so much. He was pleased to send his son to suffer and die in your place that you might be reconciled with him. 
If you've never taken up his offer of grace, why not this morning? Christians, so easy to get distracted. So easy to allow this world, which is a blessing, to become a curse eternally. Don't lose sight. If you have, turn back. And if there's anything we can do this morning, we'd ask that you come as together we stand and sing.